A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Today's episode is sponsored by Clarion. Are you grappling with the rapid pace of regulatory and compliance changes in the printing ink industry? Do you want to know more about PFAS, supply chain transparency, and extended producer responsibility? Then check out episode 137 of The Chemical Show for a discussion into PTFE-free solutions with Clarient and Nepum, where we share insights into challenges and solutions in a fast-changing printing inks world. Thanks. And now on to today's episode. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome back to The Chemical Show. Today, I am sharing insights and reflections from third quarter 2023 earnings reports. There is no doubt that 2023 has been a challenging year, much more so than we expected at the beginning of the year. Things like inventory destocking, lower prices and earnings, and really an overall challenging market influenced by interest rates, energy, and a number of things. What I did today for this episode is I've looked at reports from both publicly held companies, and I'm also bringing in insights from a variety of private companies whose leaders I've spoken with recently. And I'm looking at three things. Number one, how did they perform? Number two, what did these companies say about their performance? And that's actually really interesting. You learn a lot about a company's mindset and culture when you look at what they're saying about their performance. And then three, the actions that they are taking in response to the markets and the challenges that they've had this year and things that we can learn from and you can learn from and apply to your business. You'll recall that mid-year with the second quarter's earnings reports, many companies recast their expectations for 2023 overall and for, started to forecast and, and give indications of much lower returns than they originally projected for the years. There's a couple of reasons behind this. And, and when you think about where were companies a year ago when they were setting these budgets and these targets, we were coming off of two strong years, right? Second half of 2020 into the second half of 2022. That's when we really started to see the decline in third and fourth quarter of 22. And the reality is many companies expected an uptick in 2023, that this was going to be a temporary reset in the second half of 22. The reality is, as we've all discovered, that is not the case. And so many companies have adjusted their full year outlook down. They're taking very tactical actions and decisions about how they're running their business to, in order to maximize profits and return cash. What I think is interesting is even with those reforecasts, it still did not prevent several companies from missing their third quarter earnings reports. And, and I'd love to be a fly on the wall as they talk about this with their board and their shareholders about why those misses happen. But there we go. We have it there. You'll recall that I did a similar episode last quarter. So when I reflected on the second quarter, 2023 earnings and my word for that, those were earnings reports and my general observation was challenging. That was the resounding theme that was coming through in the second quarter earnings reports. And if you want to hear more about second quarter 23, check out episode 118 of The Chemical Show. It's still available upon our website and on all the podcast reporters. And you'll listen to what I had to say at that point about what was going on mid-year with chemical companies. If I had to sum up third quarter 2023 in a word, that word would be weak demand, weak earnings, and a weak outlook. That was a recurring theme across companies when I looked at earnings reports. Why did we move from challenging to weak? And I, I actually think this is a bit of an acceptance of where the year is. 
Not that companies are not doing their best to exercise commercial discipline and commercial excellence, but we're accepting and we're recognizing that it's weak. So if you can imagine, if I take an analogy of a fighter, you start out strong and feisty. I think we started out the year strong and feisty and hopeful. Mid-year recognize this challenge and now we're feeling that it's weak and really just looking for survival and wondering when will this year be over? So another word that I've used recently to describe third quarter 23 is tepid. It actually showed up in the earnings report. You're going to hear about that more later. And I saw a video broadcast, which is available on YouTube and also on the particular company's website of a super major that I described to several people I know is that was really tepid, like not really believing, just weak. So, you know, word of the third quarter earnings reports week. That's the one thing if you're going to remember. What were the highlights or maybe we should say lowlights, but highlights and lowlights as we look at the third quarter 23 earnings reports. Number one, the headline from Lanxis maybe says it all. Persistently weak demand impacts the third quarter, right? And there's a number of reasons for that. Inventory destocking continues. I think we expected that by this point in the year, the destocking would be done. And that's clearly not happening. Or some people have projected now that we're at the end and that we're at a flat point. I don't know. We thought that at the end of the second quarter as well. So stay tuned. I think at some point the pantries are depleted and people are going to have to start buying again. Companies that have more diversified business and markets saw more balance. So we've seen really mixed results, actually, when you look across the industry. And some of this is dependent on how focused uh, markets and regions that companies are playing in and selling into. So for instance, Lion Del Bissell, they've openly recognized that the results were boosted by an exceptional quarter for OxyFuel's margins, which helped their intermediates business. And at the same time, polymers, not so much. In fact, here comes the word. They describe this tepid polymer demand, which I think most people in the polymers markets would agree with that. Newspecs talks about having a balanced portfolio, delivering strong improvement. Again, recognizing that the benefit of playing in with different products in different markets has provided balance. And then Bruntag, to bring a distributor's point of view into it, they had really great, strong cash generation. And we're going to talk more about, about cash later based on their diverse portfolio and recognize that there was mixed performance picture across divisions and regions. But the key to this and the key to creating a more balanced quarter and balanced results is, of course, balance and diversification. And we've seen that and that's coming through loud and clear when you look at companies and across earning reports and what they're saying. The other big thing that came through loud and clear in third quarter earnings reports is a real focus on cash management and cost control. We talked about this a little bit in the second quarter reports. This should be of no surprise. When markets are tough, you start preserving cash. And in fact, one of the things people talk about is disciplined capital management and a framework to manage that. Um, Eastman, interestingly, talked about decisive actions to reduce inventory. That's one of the things that they credit their financials and reasonably okay financials for the third quarter on. Now, again, back to this whole inventory story, good news, bad news. Um, if you're relying on companies to be buying your product, you're hoping that their inventory is flat and they're not destocking. Um if you're managing your cash outflow, aggressive actions to reduce inventory, which has the benefit of reducing working capital and just having, frankly, less money tied up is a good thing. And that all ties around to commercial discipline. And commercial discipline is really maybe the key for 2023 and for the markets that we're in today and really going into 24 as well. We'll be right back. At EcoVist, they're accelerating the transition to a sustainability-driven future. Their long history of innovation, expertise, and customer collaboration supports the development of proprietary catalysts and services across their two industry-leading businesses, Advanced Materials and Catalysts and EcoServices. Advanced Materials and Catalysts is a leader in proprietary and customized technologies for polymers, cleaner fuels, emissions control, and circularity. 
EcoServices is the largest North American recycler of spent sulfuric acid. EcoVist, your catalyst for positive change. The fourth thing that comes through is really inventory and forecasting challenges. Continued destocking. Again, I referenced this a little bit earlier. Some companies are projecting that we're at the end of this destocking period. Others have basically acknowledged that they're just not sure that the destocking has taken place. They're hopeful that we're at a flat point and coming back up and that we're at peak destocking. But what I think is going to be interesting, of course, is as we go into Q4, you and I both know many companies are really managing their balance sheet tightly as it gets to the year end. So I think we're going to continue to see low inventories and companies either destocking or frankly, just not buying. And that's the other piece that we're hearing is forecasting. Both public and private companies have lamented the lack of forecasting and poor forecasting. And frankly, what some would say is less forward planning from their customers. The flip side of this is what we're also hearing, and I've heard from a number of companies, is that companies are waiting longer to take purchase decisions. So on the one hand, it may seem like poor forecasting, and it is because as a seller, you would love to have a great forecast from your customers so that you can manage your production, manage your inventories, understand expectations. On the seller side and on the customer side, you're caught in that pinch. And so waiting as long as you can to make that purchase decision until you know it's backed by a sale someplace else has been critical. And so what we're seeing is really a compression of the buy-sell cycle. I think that's one of the things I've seen consistently across businesses and markets is a compression of that buy-sell cycle, frankly, because nobody wants to be sitting on inventory that they're not certain about where it's going and how it's moving. Being opportunistic from both a buyer and seller perspective has also played a key role in the third quarter, probably leading up to it through this whole year. So from Grace Matthews Fall Outlook, and I will link their assessment into the show notes. They provide a great overview. And obviously Grace Matthews is a little bit more focused on M&A, but they do look at the overall markets and what's going on. They actually talked about companies taking the opportunity to enter RFQs and to take bids on products and on purchases. And using this market dislocation, if you will, to be a bit more opportunistic and basically resetting their purchasing decisions. I've heard about that from elsewhere. And in fact, we talked about this a little bit at the chemical summit and about just some of the challenges that brings to bear benefits on the buy side, sometimes a challenge on the sell side. The other thing when I look at being opportunistic, and this comes through in a maybe a bit of a subtle way, but It is a statement that I've read in a number of earnings reports that several companies are citing projected benefits from new contracts and customers. So taking advantage of the market conditions and going places where they haven't gone before, bringing new contracts and new customers into place where they expect to realize benefits maybe the fourth quarter, maybe more likely 2024. So putting the the foundations and the structures in place to benefit next year's business. The other thing that we're seeing, and this is coming through in a number of places, is really asset rationalization and restructuring. So many companies in their earnings reports reflected on permanent shutdowns of suboptimal or less strategic manufacturing sites. So this came through with Selenies, Ingevity, Camores, there's others. Um, my friend John Richardson at ICIS has been talking about this and the likely need for capacity rationalization in certain markets really focused in on polymers in his case due to capacity overbuild. But I think we're seeing this. We're seeing this recognition and there's a lot of sassy names for various transformation and restructuring programs that people are putting in place. They're claiming big earnings, 100 million here, 200 million there. Maybe your company doesn't have that much to give. And so it's going to be a different number. But we're seeing the beginning or perhaps the middle of a number of transformation and restructuring programs taking place with some of those same companies that I mentioned already that are shutting down assets, but others as well. So 
We talked about quiet quitting seemed to be the first thing uh, we talked about a couple of years ago. Now we're into maybe quiet firing. There has definitely been some retirement programs put in place, so-called retirement programs. So packaging people out to reduce workforce and ultimately reduce cash flow and overall fixed costs. So we are, I think in maybe early to mid days of this, I think we're going to continue to see more, particularly as we get to year end with real expectations that these really manifest fully in 2024. At the Chemical Summit, which occurred just a few weeks ago, we polled attendees about the one thing they wished their customer would do differently in supporting and serving their suppliers. So, you know, I've already hit on one of these things. Number one, First and foremost, better forecasting. So this, I don't know, semi-opportunistic lack of forecasting, which has taken the place of this compressed buy-sell cycle. What do suppliers want? Suppliers want better forecasting. Of course, I got to be honest, for my entirety of my career, the number one thing I hear all the time is we wish our customers would forecast better. We wish we would have better forecasting. So this is an ongoing opportunity and challenge. I do think it's possible that AI and machine learning and some of the digitization tools that we put in place will improve this if we allow them to. So that's an interesting one. Number two, communication and transparency, that suppliers are looking for better communication from their customers. We often talk about it the other way. So customers highly value communication from their suppliers. Hey guys, suppliers also highly value communication and transparency from their customers. And so Teamwork. To me, this is really critical aspects of teamwork, partnership, and collaboration. And then the third piece was no e-auctions. So when I saw this, I actually left. I'm like, are people still doing this? I thought this was done and died. And no, it's alive and well. The challenge with this, of course, is it is really hard to create value. True value, true partnership, true collaboration. When customers are boiling it down to a very transactional decision. Now, in the backdrop of what we're looking at here in 2023, where companies are focused in on cost management, commercial discipline, commercial excellence, e-auctions, RFQs, being very tight and rigorous makes sense, right? From just a short, sheer cash perspective. It's got to be balanced though. It's got to be balanced so that you're not missing the rest of the value equation as the markets develop today and tomorrow. I'm actually including a graphic about those one things that suppliers wish their customers would do differently on the website. So if you head over to thechemicalshow.com and look at today's episode, you will see that graphic there. And I think you might find it insightful. Looking ahead to quarter four. Right. What is the expectation when you look at the statements, the earnings reports, the other things that companies are talking about? Number one, normalizing. I think there is a belief that we are flattening the curve, that the earnings deceleration is slowing, that the inventory destocking is slowing and maybe is gone. There is a belief that that peak destocking has occurred already. And then I think there's this aspect of we just want to get through the year. So flipping over to what can we learn from companies' approaches to the challenges of 2023? Number one, first and foremost, commercial discipline, right? So an aggressive cash focus. It's interesting. Some companies are really using those words and and that's the aspect of words that matter, right? Aggressive cash focus, management of the details. It's almost this aspect of no detail is too small. If you want to hear more about commercial discipline, I actually recorded an episode on this after second quarter because we were starting to hear from companies then as well. It's episode 120, the importance of commercial discipline in unlocking resilience in challenging times. We're still in challenging times. Go take a listen to that episode. So commercial discipline, first and foremost. The second piece is continued investment in strategic projects, right? So I referenced earlier a comment about disciplined capital management, which also implies that there is continued investment in these strategic projects. What falls into the strategic project category? IT projects. Digitization falls into that category. In some cases, it's new builds and continued investment in assets, right? And we're certainly seeing that from a number of companies that are doing that. And then the third one is really innovation. 
innovation in business models, innovation in products. When we look at where we are in a broader context, the chemical industry is continuing on a sustainability path and we're not going to get to peak sustainability without innovation. And so still seeing tremendous investment in that area. The third thing that we can learn from companies' approaches to the challenges of 2023 is recognizing value and optimizing high value products. So I talked about this a little bit in my second quarter um, summary. This is really about figuring out where the greatest value in use is and making sure that you are optimizing sales of those products and figuring out what customers really value. Everybody is obviously tightening up and being more disciplined as we've already talked about. So figuring out where you create the most value allows you to maximize cash and to maximize your earnings. That's it for today's episode of The Chemical Show. I would love to hear what you thought. What are you seeing as you look at what's happened in the third quarter and the reports of third quarter's earnings and how your company and your business is tackling Q4 and 2024, which is right around the corner? Shoot me an email, send me a DM on LinkedIn. Would love to hear from you. And in the meantime, keep listening, keep following, keep sharing, and we will talk to you again soon.